snorting ants, smuggled drugs, an army-led removal from Thailand. Rock and roll has long been associated with depravity and excess, but the parties thrown by these bands achieved infamy. Nikki Six co-founded Motley Crue in 1981. They became one of the biggest bands of the decade, but their wild party-hardy antics attracted almost as much attention as their music, and their shenanigans have become the stuff of raunchy legend. However, there was one time when Six partied a little too hard. It was on December 23, 1987, and the Motley Crue bassist was binging with fellow rockers Slash and Steven Adler of Guns N' Roses, Robin Crosby of Rat, and David Ellefson of Megadeth. Some of the specifics of the heavy metal bash are hazy, but one thing was clear. There were plenty of drugs involved. When the party landed at the Franklin Plaza Hotel, Six overdosed on heroin and had to be taken to the hospital. He was then declared dead for two minutes before being resuscitated. According to The Dirt, Confessions of the World's Most Notorious Rock Band, Six recalls having an out-of-body experience, saying, I looked down and realized that I had left my body. Nikki Six, or the filthy, tattooed container that had once held him, was lying covered face to toe with the sheet on a gurney, being pushed by medics into an ambulance. By 1984, Motley Crue had more than established itself as the band to beat, but nipping at the Crue's heels was the glam metal outfit Hanoi Rocks. While they hadn't achieved the level of fame as Motley Crue, they had just released an album with a major label and were about to start their first American tour. It only makes sense that both bands teamed up to party, as Hanoi Rock's gluttony for revelry rivaled Motley Crue's. What resulted was a constant party that lasted for several days in Los Angeles. As expected, the nonstop immoral marathon led to a beer shortage, which prompted a very drunk Vince Neil of Motley Crue to get more beer with Hanoi Rock's drummer Razzle. Unfortunately, the two rockers never made it to the liquor store as Neil, driving 65 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone, swerved too quickly and collided with two oncoming cars. Razzle died in the accident, but Neil's punishment for his actions was lighter than you might expect. 15 days in jail and $2.6 million later, and he was a free man. This is misfortune. We obviously came together and helped the cat out. Billy Idol became a major draw in the 1980s, with the help of the then new MTV. Some of his biggest hits from the era include White Wedding, Dancing With Myself, and Rebel Yell. The decade was a great time for Idol, perhaps too great. Following the breakup with his girlfriend, model Perry Lister, Idol and a friend went on a weeks-long bender in Thailand that included sleeping with as many women as they could and ingesting numerous substances that shouldn't be mixed together. The two got tired of drinking alcohol, so they asked their cab driver to fetch them some cocaine. He later returned with what Idol claimed was the strongest heroin available at the time. Throughout this everlasting blowout, Idol and his friend went through multiple hotels, racking up around $20,000 in damages. Idol's partying got so out of hand that the military had to be called in. He told Classic Rock that the drugs he took made him become violent, adding, I think we went through a few hotels like that before the Thai army escorted me out of the country on a gurney. I mean, obviously you're completely clean now, but you don't totally regret all of that, do you? No, not at all. Jimmy Page is one of the most important and influential guitarists in all of rock history, becoming a six-string giant after joining Robert Plant, bassist John Paul Jones, and drummer John Bonham to form the mighty Led Zeppelin. The band dominated the airwaves throughout the 1970s, so it's no wonder that they got into all kinds of scandalous hijinks. One of their more fabled antics involved Page and Bonham thinking up a new way to entertain a room full of groupies waiting for them at the hotel they were staying at. The two put their shaggy heads together and hatched the perfect scheme have Page strip down, cover himself in whipped cream, and get escorted to their guests on a cart, with Bonham dressed like a waiter. We'll let you use your imagination as to how the rest of the festivities played out, though because Led Zeppelin was so popular at the time, it's easy to assume that the groupies were probably pretty excited about their human dessert. For anyone who's read their book The Dirt or seen the movie it's based on, you'll know that Motley Crue has partied enough to fill up a dozen of these videos. But there's one particular get-together that far exceeds even Motley Crue's wildest antics, and it includes the Prince of Darkness himself showing the boys how it's done. The story goes as follows. While Motley Crue was on tour with Ozzy Osbourne, they made a stop in Lakeland, Florida, where they hung out by the pool one day. Ozzy was in the mood for cocaine. But because the band didn't have any, he instead snorted a line of live ants that were crawling nearby. But just to make sure he placed first in this party-hardy competition, 
Ozzy immediately followed this up with another gross act. He urinated on the ground, then got down on all fours and licked it up. Ozzy turned to the stunned Cruz bassist and said, Do that, Six. As low as it was at the time, Nikki Six did have enough self-respect to give that particular win to the true party animal. Ozzy's guitarist at the time, Jake E. Lee, told Tone Talk that Ozzy wasn't gross enough to snort live ants and that all he snorted was a tiny spider. But what about the urine part? That, Lee said, was true. It's not uncommon for A-list celebrities to make appearances at rock stars' parties. However, what's less common is them showing up at parties set in drug rehabilitation centers. That's exactly what happened in 1975. At the time, proto-punk rocker Iggy Pop was institutionalized in a UCLA facility for his drug addiction following a string of related misdemeanors. Wanting to cheer up a friend during a tough time, David Bowie decided to pay him a visit and smuggle in some cocaine. Accompanying him was Oscar-nominated actor Dean Stockwell, and the story goes that the two adorned themselves with spacesuit costumes and arrived at the facility demanding to see their buddy. The staff, for whatever reason, thought it totally fine to let them in, and Bowie and Stockwell arrived at Iggy's room for a drug-fueled soiree. There's another version of the story wherein the actor who actually accompanied Bowie was Dennis Hopper. The singer told Blender, If I remember right, it was me and Dennis Hopper. We trooped into the hospital with a load of drugs for him. This was very much a leave your drugs at the door hospital. We were out of our minds, all of us. He wasn't well, that's all we knew. We thought we should bring him some drugs, because he probably hadn't had any for days. Freddie Mercury is one of rock and roll's great singers. With a stunning range that went from operatic highs to bluesy mids, his voice played a major part in turning Queen into the iconic band that it is today. All the while, Mercury developed a reputation for his extravagant lifestyle that only his massive stage presence could rival. I'm a big ham, really. I just get on that stage and, and do it. When it came to birthdays, the Queen singer wanted to throw extravagant parties, and money was no obstacle to that. One of his most infamous bashes was his 41st birthday party at the Pikes Hotel on the Mediterranean island of Ibiza. Held in 1987, the party saw the singer fly in 700 of his friends. There were so many balloons decorating the party that it required hotel staff three days to fill them with helium. The high-profile crowd went through a reported 350 bottles of champagne and marveled at a fireworks show that, to unsuspecting bystanders, probably looked like the beginning of the next world war. For Freddie Mercury's 39th birthday party, like all of his other birthday parties, he decided to push hedonism in a surprising new direction. This time, it was in the form of a black and white affair. But don't let the minimalist colors fool you. There was still plenty of depravity on display. This particular party took place at a club in Munich called Mrs. Henderson and included 100 guests who he encouraged to dress in formal drag. For his part, Mercury appeared in a typically over-the-top Harlequin costume that made it clear to everyone in attendance just whose party it was. One of the more fascinating details about this party is that footage of it was included in the promotional video for Mercury's solo song, Living On My Own, but was not actually released. Apparently, record label head honcho Walter Yetnikoff was disgusted by sexually charged images in the video, and so it wasn't seen by the public until eight years after the infamous bash. It's a fairly tame video by today's standards, but it's probably safe to assume that things were a lot wilder just off screen. By the late 1970s, Queen was one of the most popular bands in the world, so it only made sense for Freddie Mercury to throw an album release party for their 1978 album, Jazz, that would make all other album release parties look like church barbecue. While the band agreed to a 200,000 pound budget for the shindig, Mercury completely ignored the order and went nuts by booking the stunning Fairmont Hotel in New Orleans' French Quarter and inviting 500 people. Publicist Bob Gibson was tasked with recruiting entertainment for the evening. Telling Uncut, Freddie decided that he wanted to bring in a lot of street people to liven things up. I was instructed to find anyone vaguely offbeat who might bring a little, ahem, color to proceedings. And color they did. The entertainers included contortionists, fire eaters, drag queens, and little people with trays of cocaine on their heads. Is it any wonder why this affair has been dubbed Saturday Night in Sodom? I don't really take myself that seriously. Not anymore. Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones in general were presented as a rougher counterpoint to the more polished brand of the Beatles, who were beginning their domination of the airwaves in the 1960s. While the Beatles played songs about wanting to hold a girl's hand, the raunchier Stones played songs about wanting to spend the night with her. Is it any wonder that the latter band went all out when it came to partying? Jagger in particular was a sucker for a good time as evidenced by his notorious 29th birthday bash. The band kicked things off with a performance at Madison Square Garden, 
followed by a huge 500-guest party at the St. Regis Roof Ballroom that was capped off by the band's members throwing custard pies at their frontman. But the fun only ended for the paying guests. For the A-list VIPs, the blowout continued well into the morning. And what's a birthday party without a birthday cake? Of course, this being a birthday cake for Mick Jagger, it contained the mostly naked Andy Warhol ingenue Jerry Miller to surprise the Stone singer. While Elton John has more than deserved the recognition he's received for his musical talents, he's garnered almost as much attention for his grandiose stage presence and hard-partying ways. His most memorable party was the one celebrating his 50th birthday in 1997. The only venue that could contain the gargantuan event was the Hammersmith Palais Music Hall, which saw over 600 guests attend. There were festivities galore at the glorious affair, but the main attraction was John's luxurious entrance. The icon arrived in an ostentatious King Louis XIV-inspired outfit that also included a three-foot-tall wig. The outfit is so legendary that it's now featured in an exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. While John's threads were the highlight of the affair, there were so many guests decked out in the most lavish costumes that the singer told Louder Sound that he, quote, didn't recognize half the people at the party until the end. 